Uhum. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Bonjour, Johannes. Pour nous, c'est un grand plaisir de vous accueillir dans notre université, même si par l'Internet. Oui. Uh, je vais faire la présentation en portugais. Bom, é um prazer para nós recebermos aqui o professor eh, Johannes Angermüller e eh, é com muita alegria que eu faço a apresentação desse grande pesquisador estudioso com grandes contribuições eh, também ao Brasil. Uh, o professor Johannes Angermüller tem formação em sociologia e linguística com doutorado em análise do discurso por um programa de cotutela das universidades Paris 12, na França, e de Magdeburg, na Alemanha. É professor dedicado aos estudos de discurso, linguagens e linguística aplicada, vinculado à Open University, no Reino Unido, e ao Centre d'Etudes de Mouvement Social da École de Études en Sciences Sociales, em Paris. Ele também é presidente fundador da DiscourseNet, International Association of Discourse Studies, uma rede interinstitucional de pesquisadores de discurso. É conhecido por suas pesquisas sobre os discursos científico e político, sobretudo pós-estruturalismo, e atualmente está interessado nos estudos de ciência e tecnologia e no trabalho qualitativo e teórico em torno das construções discursivas, das posições de sujeito e da pragmática enunciativa. Embora seus interesses de pesquisa estejam centrados na construção discursiva de ordem social, possui também ampla experiência em estudos dedicados aos discursos acadêmicos, educacionais e políticos em países como França, Alemanha, Reino Unido, Espanha e Rússia. Menciona aqui algumas delas. Os livros Análise de Discurso Pós-Estruturalista, publicado pela editora Pontes em 2016, e a obra Por que não há pós-estruturalismo na França, a formação de uma geração intelectual, eu fiz aqui a tradução do título original, é, essas obras foram traduzidas para diferentes idiomas, francês, alemão, português, espanhol e turco. É, eu ainda comento aqui, menciono artigos publicados em português e em espanhol, um artigo publicado na revista Sociologia Histórica, como ser um filósofo acadêmico, discurso como prática de posicionamento em vários níveis, uh, um artigo publicado na revista Redis, Revista de Estudos do Discurso, A Verdade na Era da Pós-Verdade, por um programa forte em estudos do discurso, é, uma entrevista é, publicada na revista Fórum Linguístico, e eu menciono ainda uma revista concedida, a revista escrita, na escrita de 2001, concedida à professora Luciana Salazar Salgado e Letícia Clares, que eu, inclusive, recorri a essa entrevista para fazer essa apresentação. Eu quero mencionar, por fim, uma obra ainda não publicada, mas penso em vias de publicação, ela deve sair agora, em 2023, uh, por uma editora londrina, em coautoria com Felipe Blanchard, e é um, um livro que examina a trajetória da carreira de quase 2 mil professores de linguística e sociologia na Alemanha, na França e no Reino Unido. Quero muito ler, professor, esse livro quando ele estiver disponível. Professor eh, Johannes Angermüller, a, a palavra é sua. Muito obrigada pela sua presença no nosso seminário, eh, fechando essas atividades eh, durante toda a semana. Uh, muito obrigado pelo convite. Uh, é um grande prazer. Uh, ficar com, com vocês. Um, vou falar em inglês, o que é muito mais fácil para mim, mas entendo que um, haverá uma tradução de Gabriel. Um, muito um, agradeço, Gabriel e Juliana, pela tradução. 
um, da, da apresentação também. Um, muito obrigado. Um, vou tentar uh, colocar a apresentação e agora ah, aqui. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I hope you can hear and understand me. Um, if I speak too fast, uh, please let me know. I understand that translating is not um, um, is not uh, a gift for you, Gabrielle. Um, especially not uh, for stuff that can be quite uh, complex and obscure times. So um, I try to speak slowly so that you can follow what, um, what I'm trying to say about uh, discourses of post-truth uh, today. Um, populist uh, post-truth discourse, discourses are a problem uh, for many of us. Uh, for us as citizens, of course, uh, we can be quite critical about uh, claims make, made about um, minorities and um, uh, and uh, about the world, uh, which uh, which are violent um, and uh, break certain norms. But also as discourse analysts, we can't be um, indifferent to um, discourses which are against science and uh, which can be a threat um, to our autonomy as researchers. Um, of course, there are some uh, governments influenced by post-truth discourses who have been trying to uh, cut our funding and... Um, to, um, uh, to um, um, take away our, our study programs. So um, we need to be wary of that. What I want to talk about here in this uh, 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 conference, of course, is uh, the, the epistemological dimensions of post-truth discourses for discourse studies. Because um, if we talk about um, post-truth discourses, we... Um, we imply, of course, a position of truth as well in order to um, to talk about these discourses. And that uh, challenges some ideas in discourse studies, um, which um, have tried to deconstruct uh, truth as, uh, as an effect of power knowledge. So what I want to do here in this talk is um, to come up with a model, some sort of account of post-truth discourses, and uh, to bring uh, truth back into discourse studies. Um, of course, um, discourse studies and discourse theory has never been neutral uh, towards uh, society. There has been an exchange between uh, discourse studies and society. Uh, sometimes um, discourse analysts criticize certain um, tendencies in society and politics. On the other hand, uh, certain actors in the political world uh, take up um, certain ideas from discourse studies as well. So it's a two-way relationship. Um, it doesn't ha happen very often, but I just want to uh, remind that uh, there are some people on, on the radical right, the new right, um, who have uh, drawn on Gramscianism and uh, some, some elements of discourse theory. Uh, for example, in France, La Nouvelle Droite, Alain de Benoit, um, have made the case for a right-wing Gramscianism. And that has been uh, influential for Alexander Dugin, uh, who is Putin's major ideologue. Um, and also for uh, Stephen Bannon, uh, who was uh, called Trump's brains. So um, <clears throat> a discourse studies needs to think about its relationship it has with the discourses it analyzes. And this is not a one-way relationship. Uh, we, um, we need to, uh, of course, um, recognize that um, political actors don't uh, take up on discourse theory very often. It's, um, it's uh, sporadic. But uh, we, uh, we are not in a world where our point of view um, cannot be taken on uh, from others. And, um, and of course, um, if we think of post-truth discourses, that's a particular problem. Okay, yeah. Um, especially if we think of uh, the critical attitude, uh, the critical gesture of discourse theorists. Um, we, uh, of course, like to question certain facts, uh, we want to develop a critical consciousness. Uh, we want to engage in a democratic, um, egalitarian debate about uh, social problems. And uh, we recognize there are many ways um, of, um, of seeing the world. And there is a um, certain epistemological uh, pluralism. And, um, and this is not that far from what many populists um, uh, claim as well. 
Um, if uh, populists uh, make the case for alternative realities, which are distinct from mainstream reality, I mean, this is a kind of uh, critical um, uh, question of facts. Um, there's, uh, of course, um, uh, a great deal of critical um, uh, uh, awareness uh, around um, the way that uh, power relationships inform our, our views of the world. And, um, and, and, and many populist circles have made the case for everybody being an expert. And, um, and this is something uh, that, uh, that reminds us that our positions as scientists and as citizens uh, can be very, very easily switched. We can speak as scientists, but we are at the same time uh, citizens. At the same time, we can speak as citizens, as critical citizens, as populist uh, uh, citizens. And uh, we can uh, also take the position of, of, of scientists. And, um, and this switching of position is uh, something that uh, cr uh, critical discourse studies um, uh, needs to deal with. And especially in post-truth discourses, this is quite a problem because um, how can we avoid um, taking on um, uh, positions from the other side? How can we say that we can be critical, uh, but they can't uh, uh, question our own uh, point of view? And, uh, and so what I want to do in this, um, in this talk is basically uh, talk about that problem. I mean, how can we deal uh, with, uh, with contemporary public discourse critically um, while recognizing that others um, who, are not, uh, who don't agree with us also um, are critical of, of, of certain things, including of ourselves. And I will um, draw on some strands in discourse studies and uh, discuss uh, what they mean. And uh, the main question of my talk is, if discourse is, um, is power and knowledge, um, isn't um, the discourse of post-truth also a kind of critical discourse analysis? And um, I will uh, give you some examples of how to see um, uh, contemporary public discourse in order to come up uh, with a model that accounts for, for truth as something that needs to be defended um, in our discourse. Um, let me start with a few uh, thoughts about discourse studies. And um, basically, I would see um, three major strands that deal with the problem of truth in discourse. The first strand is, um, is basically um, uh, discourse ethics. For discourse ethics, uh, truth is uh, something that can be um, uh, justified from, from the very fact of language following certain rules. So discourse ethics says, that uh, whenever we use language, we acknowledge certain rules that we need to, um, um, to, um, to respect in order to communicate. And that's why uh, discourse ethics says that we can um, start um, uh, criticizing others on, on, on the basis of uh, certain language rules. Now, I don't want to really pursue um, discourse ethics as a... Um, as, um, as a root here, because we're talking here about uh, truths in in, uh, in in discourse, which uh, depend on certain um, uh, claims about reality, and um, and and basically, uh, what I want to 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 say here is that two strands of um, of discourse studies um, that um, uh, that talk about uh, truth, and uh, the first one is uh, constructivism. Um, and constructivism says that truth basically is constructed through um, discursive practices, through the repetition of certain um, expressions, through discursive dynamics in large um, um, communities, uh, which make certain things real. And, um, and from a constructivist point of view, truth is an effect of um, discourses um, um, in large communities, the repetition and um, um, the large number of, of people repeating certain things. And um, the problem here with discourse, uh, with constructivist discourse studies, of course, is that there's no way to distinguish between uh, true and less true discourse, because for, for a constructivist uh, discourse uh, researcher, everything basically is equally true. There's no distinction between certain um, truer or less uh, true um, uh, discourses. Um, the other strand uh, is what I call realist um, discourse studies, 
um, a great deal of critical discourse analysis is uh, realist in that it, it believes there are certain realities behind or before discourse, as it were, um, like certain power relationships, um, certain realities um, outside discourse, which discourse um, can hide or conceal. And um, the task of the critical uh, discourse researcher is to show um, these um, these hidden realities in order to criticize um, the lies and manipulation within discourse. And uh, this, of course, is a very different way of uh, conceptualizing um, truth, uh, because here the discourse researcher refers to reality uh, that is visible um, to him or her in order to, um, to, to evaluate certain discourses as true or not so true or, or wrong. Uh, whereas in constructivism, there's no such way to evaluate um, discourses in terms of truth. Every discourse is equally true or false, and um, you can't really distinguish between truth um, between certain um, um, uh, between different discourses. Now, um, with post-truth discourses, uh, I guess there's a natural spontane spontaneous idea that okay, if if we finally realize they're true and untrue discourses. Uh, we just need to go back to realism. And um, I think this is a, a problematic thing to do because uh, realism is not very um, um, coherent in that it says there's um, a reality outside discourse that uh, we can use in order to uh, criticize certain things within discourse. And um, it is less coherent um, from a discourse theoretical point of view than constructivism because it applies an explanation of um, uh, certain problems in discourse, which is different from the explanation um, of, um, of certain truths in discourse. So for, for realism, the problem is there's a reality outside which needs to be explained in very different uh, terms than discourse itself. And, um, and so um, I would suggest a constructivist approach to truth and discourse, which um, 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 recognizes that they're truths, and that's a big problem. So in a way, we have these two alternatives, and I want to um, propose a middle way, as it were, so that we can see how certain truths are constructed as, um, um, as discursive uh, phenomena. But at the same time, uh, uh, we need to acknowledge and recognize, of course, uh, that uh, not, not, not everything is equal, not every discourse is equally true. And, um, and that's uh, what I want to show here with uh, my model of discourse as a um, uh, practice of positioning in discourse and as a uh, practice of claim making in discourse. Um, let me start uh, with some thoughts about contemporary social media discourse and the way that um, so certain uh, social uh, controversies have, have worked over the last uh, few years. If we want to... Um, to understand what are the positions within discourse that make a difference from where we can talk and make a difference within discourse. Uh, we can nowadays analyze very easily uh, the major um, outlets in social media discourse. This is a representation of the major uh, Twitter uh, accounts in, um, in the discourse around Brexit in, in the UK. Um, Brexit, of course, is a controversy that has been going on for many years. And uh, we see here that um, uh, there's a number of actors, of, um, uh, of journals, of, um, of, of, of newspapers, of, uh, of TV stations um, that uh, have made a difference uh, within Twitter. Um, if we want to um, uh, ha have a, a, a representation of, of American controversies, we see here the 500 most important um, um, uh, media outlets in Twitter because uh, all the TV stations and uh, newspapers have major Twitter accounts and we can analyze um, the, uh, the way that they're cited and, um, uh, and shared uh, within the Twitter sphere. And the point now is that within um, social media discourse, there are very clear structures of uh, social inequality. There are certain uh, Twitter accounts which are much more important than other Twitter accounts. There are certain subject positions from where you can make certain things um, um, visible. And, um, and so uh, discourse, even though everybody can talk freely and uh, there's no uh, government control and censorship, um, 
this course is very far from being equal. There's a, a great deal of concentration of visibility among very few um, actors and, um, and outlets. Um, if we want to have a look at um, the major uh, Twitter accounts of uh, leading politicians in the US, for example, this is an analysis of um, the major Twitter accounts of leading uh, political actors in, in the US. And uh, we see, of course, there's a very, very strong concentration of, um, of Twitter followers um, um, with Donald Trump. Um, that was in uh, 2018. So, um, of course, uh, th this is uh, slightly um, uh, obsolete. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump was able to concentrate, monopolize a great deal of um, Twitter visibility um, through his account. <clears throat> and if we have a, a look at um, the other actors, it's very interesting to see who is um, important here in, in Twitter. Um, Donald Trump, uh, of course, is um, a very special um, uh, political uh, phenomenon, um, not at all uh, the kind of respectable mainstream conservative um, as, as many others in, in his party before he became president. Um, and if you see the second most um, followed a politician in the Democratic Party. It is um, Alexia um, uh, Ortiz uh, Cortes, um, uh, Alexandra uh, Ocasio Cortes, um, who is a young congresswoman uh, who is quite uh, radical and, um, and seen as a populist um, left-leaning uh, Democrat. And uh, if we have a look at uh, other uh, more traditional uh, political figures, they don't really um, have uh, quite as much uh, followership as, um, as uh, uh, those more populist uh, figures. The, so this clearly shows that there's a great deal of concentration um, among very few subject positions. And if we want to account for why certain ideas uh, become visible in uh, social media discourse, uh, we really need to look into the structures of visibility and um, the unequal uh, weight of certain uh, positions that these uh, different actors uh, occupy in discourse. Um, we can uh, go on with a more structural analysis of um, how visibility is distributed in discourse. If we have a look at the media outlets, uh, media outlets, of course, um, is another very important um, 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 area of, of investigation because it's not just uh, political figures, but it's also about corporations, media corporations, who are important or not so important. And what we can see here is um, uh, during the, um, uh, the, the early years of Trump, uh, I think this is from 2018 as well, we see a very strong concentration of visibility among uh, very few media outlets in the world. And um, I mean, this is English. So uh, of course, I mean, English is not everything. And if we did an analysis in, in Portuguese, it would look very different. But I think the overall tendency would be very much the same. There are about 10 outlets which concentrate basically um, uh, most of, um, of, of the Twitter shares and, 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 and the Twitter activity. In the US, this is, for example, CNN, New York Times, Huffington Post, Washington Post, Politico. Now, the interesting thing about this is uh, we have a very important role for rather liberal centrist left leaning um, media outlets. I'm not saying they're radical left, but um, it's definitely not um, kind of uh, right wing uh, media here. <clears throat> and if we have a look at uh, right leaning media outlets, uh, we see Breitbart. Um, I think this is um, overstated. This is no longer the case. Um, this was uh, 2018 and Fox News. Uh, Fox News is definitely um, a, a very important uh, media outlet. And um, the other more um, traditional uh, conservative media outlets don't really exist. So um, uh, what, what, what we can say here is that uh, from that kind of structural point of view, there's a great deal of concentration with uh, certain populist politicians and most of them are right, right wing. And there's also, uh, at the same time, um, a concentration of visibility uh, with certain media outlets, which tend to be left leaning. And uh, I think that's important in order to understand the, um, the contemporary, the current uh, dynamics in, 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 in politics, namely that it is, it is very kind of um, rewarding for politicians 
uh, to go for the populist right-wing um, discourse because that attracts a lot of uh, attention in, in the media sphere and in, in the uh, social media sphere. But for, uh, for, for the newspapers, it is rewarding to go for the left-leaning um, for the left-leaning positions. And um, that, that means that there's a dynamic that, uh, that of course, these actors um, can, can very, um, uh, uh, can, cannot uh, avoid easily, uh, that, that forces them to follow um, the demand, as it were, and to make sure that, um, um, that they find their place, their subject position in this uh, huge space, which is very competitive. Of course, um, there's a great deal of uh, economic and political power involved here. Um, New York Times uh, was um, threatened um, before Trump came on, on the scene um, by bankruptcy. Um, all the print uh, media um, had a great deal of problems uh, surviving. And, um, and so what's, what's been happening is a kind of dynamics uh, that has uh, put into place a structure of left-leaning newspapers and right-leaning uh, politicians. And of course, um, the center ground um, is very easy to find here. And um, if, we, um, if we acknowledge that um, social media is, is a very important um, um, uh, channel for con uh, information and, and communication for, for contemporary politicians, uh, then the problem, of course, is um, if there's no um, respectable uh, conservative ground, um, how can we get uh, those right-wing people back into um, the democratic debate and make sure that uh, we have a good um, uh, civilized debate uh, again? And, um, and that will be very difficult because of these structures of visibility which draw people in different directions and which, uh, which have um, really threatened um, the center ground. So um, this, of course, is um, an example of, of an analysis, uh, which is um, very kind of um, a traditional in a way uh, for discourse studies to, um, to reveal the, um, um, the power structures within discourse. Um, I would say that these power structures are very discursive. Um, of course, I mean, you have very non-discursive resources as well. Um, you have big um, big corporations, you have um, uh, media interests, you have, of course, a political uh, uh, um, power that is very important uh, in order to understand why certain people become visible or not. But uh, there are certain things which are very, very discursive. Um, and I think most of the controversies that Trump has been involved in are very discursive. They they don't just replicate um, a certain economic um, a power uh, uh, inequal structure, but um, they create visibility in its own right um, by um, by insulting um, his adversaries, by creating discussions about uh, genderism and, and 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 woke ideology, things like that. That mobilizes many people to participate in these discourses, and that reinforces. Uh, the position, the visibility of the very few actors who capture um, the uh, attention of the very many actors, of the very many people who participate by clicking, uh, by, by logging in, by following, um, by, by mobilizing some brain space in order to follow these discourses. And um, so um, I think it is very important to recognize it's not just some external power resources that structure this, um, this uh, space of uh, uh, visibility. But um, there are lots of visibility um, dynamics that go on, which mobilize all of us. I mean, we're all involved in these uh, dynamics. And, um, and as a result of which, um, we can see um, a great deal of um, visibility inequality. Um, visibility is given to some actors, and um, Donald Trump has been extremely successful in occupying the scene for a very long, long time, even worldwide whereas many other voices don't have a chance. And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, very important. And that's an effect of everybody um, talking, using <laughs> social media. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. And, um, and so um, the question now is, how do we bring truth in here? The problem, of course, is with such a kind of constructivist, traditional kind of... Um, um, analysis of, of, um, of, of power structures in discourse, um, can we really say that 
one position is more truthful than the other. And of course we can't, because what we can see is uh, there's a great deal of, of inequality in terms of social economic power, but we can't really say that uh, one side or the other um, has a higher quality of debate or something. And, um, and so we need to do some more kind of um, uh, thinking here. And uh, what I want to do is I, I would like to, to discuss this example. Um, it's the controversy around hydroxychloroquine. I'm sure you're aware of this um, debate because it was very um, big in Brazil as well. And um, it is, um, of course, the debate around a possible cure for COVID-19, which uh, started soon after the pandemic started. There was a, a frantic um, run for uh, all kinds of solutions. Uh, people didn't know how to, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to protect themselves against the virus. And for political actors, this was, of course, a very, very um, important um, um, point in time where they needed to um, come up with solutions. And, um, and, um, and the question was, would there be um, a cure for COVID-19 and what would it be? And very, very soon in, in 2020, early 2020, Chinese doctors, um, they came up with the idea to use uh, existing uh, drugs. And that is very common in, in, in these situations to see what, what kind of molecules can be used uh, that have been tested before, um, that people know are safe um, uh, to administer to, 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 to people. And um, if there's... Um, some lucky coincidence, uh, some of these old molecules can be used in order to uh, cure a new um, virus. And uh, this is exactly what um, what a French doctor um, uh, propagated, that is uh, Didier Raoult, here um, on the top on, on the left. Didier Raoult is a um, specialist of um, infectious diseases. Um, he has worked um, in, in the medical field for, for, for 30 years. He's very, very um, established very much recognized as, um, um, as, um, as an expert in the area. And uh, Didier Raoult uh, became a, a pop star in, in, Fran in France um, during the, 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 the pandemic by, um, by making some um, um, prediction about the virus, by, um, by talking about um, uh, truth and untruth in, in medical uh, discourses. Um, he, he, he quickly became a very controversial figure as somebody who, who was trying to sell hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine. Um, he had um, some very basic tests uh, done in his hospital. And um, he said that uh, from these tests, um, one could infer that uh, hydroxychloroquine is a good cure against COVID-19. And... Um, and Raoul ha had had uh, quite some experience in, in in the French media, and he he knows how to to um, to talk on on TV. And um, and he quickly became a pop star, especially for for people critical of the government. Many people thought the government was too slow in 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 um, in, in authorizing these new drugs, and uh, Raoul uh, was very critical of um, of the bureaucracy in in the um, um, FDA, for example, in the medical um, authorization of, of drugs. And, um, and he would uh, be very skillful in mobilizing a certain populist um, sound in his, uh, um, in his discourse on COVID-19. And he became very popular among uh, people who, who were skeptical of the establishment um, of the Paris government, of um, of um, all kinds of um, leftist uh, tendencies. Raoul is uh, aligned a bit with, uh, with conservative politicians. He's not um, really um, into politics, but he's certainly not a leftist. And so he became quickly um, um, a kind of uh, messiah for, uh, for the French debate around um, uh, COVID-19. And what happened was he also got in touch uh, with some figures in the US. I don't think he ever became very much well known in the American media sphere, but he um, he had some contacts with um, the American uh, politicians and um, and uh, TV people. For example, Dr. Oz. I'm not sure you've heard of Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz is a TV doctor in in the U.S. who's very successful. He has a show on how to treat certain 
uh, conditions and um it's um it's a quite interesting show and um i mean he he has tried to to spread ideas about uh, how to live better and uh, more healthy uh but in a very kind of hollywood way of um entertaining um um the audience uh with kind of uh, easy sound bites and things like that and and oz uh, in a way has a very similar career um but he's much more in the show business and entertainment sector dr oz is a doctor um i think he was a professor at a university uh he basically left the academic sphere in order to um to concentrate full time on his show and um and so um dr oz would uh, invite uh, raul into his show where raul would talk about um his cure i mean his cure uh where there was still no conclusive evidence that it was um uh, really uh, working there were lots of people saying that um that much more time is needed in order to know whether this works and um and so um Raoul um came up uh with uh, with uh, with that supposed uh, cure for covid-19 and um and he became um the kind of um uh, voice uh, for for hydroxychloroquine and what happened is that Donald Trump took up on it right away he um basically cited Raoul and um and posted uh, the following twitter um uh, post here where he, where he touts uh, hydroxychloroquine and um acetromycin which is the same thing as um uh, what suggests um, raoul and um, he says the following thing here in his um, in his twitter account hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin taken together have a real chance to be one of the biggest game changers in the history of medicine the fda has moved mountains thank you the fda is the um, uh, medical um, authorization agency in the us so they um they decide what drugs um are legal and can be administered thank you hopefully they will both hydroxychloroquine works better with um acetromycin international journal of antimicrobial agents be put in use immediately people are dying move um i think forward god bless everyone um so this is interesting um i mean it's it's a bit atypical for trump to cite from a from an academic journal of course um but it's clear how um how uh, this intervention works there's no conclusive scientific consensus uh, consensus yet there's no evidence yet uh, around that claim and um and he comes up uh with that claim on a twitter account with 80 million followers where this of course has immediate effects so by um by posting this from this extremely important twitter account trump um uh changes the way that um medical debates are are, are done he um he also exerts a great deal of pressure on the fda to um to um um to authorize uh, the drug and um and this is this of course is extremely controversial again trump of course um doesn't only lose here um i mean even though i mean there's a great deal of um doubt already about um uh, hydroxychloroquine um there's weeks of debates around uh, that very claim um and uh, the idea that um we can finish um the the pandemic um um uh, eliminate all uh, confinement measures um and just move on with our lives trump uh, produces the hope um and um of of um going beyond the pandemic without serious social measures and um and and there are lots of critics there are lots of critics uh, from the medical profession um there are lots of critics uh, from around the political spectrum and and what what this does is of course um it produces more followers for trump it pr produces more twitter followers most of the twitter followers of trump are probably journalists um who are not exactly in favor of trump but um but that's how trump occupies the scene and so he really gains um the visibility uh, of the debate he becomes the major actor uh in a debate uh, where there're not that many other voices that can be heard and um and uh, other more expert voices are totally um are marginalized 
And I think that's uh, that's a, a very important uh, aspect of discourse. And and the point, of course, is um, that both aspects need to be seen together. There's the aspect: is it true what he says? Does the molecule really um, stop COVID nineteen? And that's um, that's one discourse. That's one aspect of this discourse. And the other discourse, and the other aspect of the discourse is: does it mobilize people? Um, does it make Trump visible as a subject? Um, does it um, um, does it um, point to those um, who can dominate the discourse? And um, and that's uh, that's a very much more social kind of aspect of discourse. And then, of course, uh, a little later, uh, Bolsonaro uh, will jump on on the very same claim. Uh, I think Bolsonaro um, uh, really stuck to that claim a very very long time until it was really clear that it doesn't work. Um, I think it took a, around a year. Um, there was a great deal of doubt and skepticism around hydroxychloroquine for a long time, but it took a year to, to pretty much prove that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Um, it is not harmful. Uh, it doesn't kill people, but it certainly doesn't help people from, um, uh, from dying from COVID-19. So um, it is not... Um, it is no cure that um, that should be administered to anybody uh, for COVID nineteen, and um, and of course um, Bolsonaro struggled with exactly the same problems. I mean, there was um, a very controversial, very difficult debate um, around the social measures, the distancing measures, um, and um, some sort of um, systematic uh, government response um, um, to, to 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 stopping the virus. And um, and there were a great deal of um, uh, critical voices uh, in his own camp um, against um, confinement um, and, and, and distancing measures, and uh, and so um, it was very important to create this controversy around um, hydroxychloroquine, which uh, which uh, helped him mobilize his uh, his troops um, and um, and, um, and 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 secure his position as um, as a politician who needs visibility in order to survive. So um, visibility is, is totally key here to this discourse. And, um, and so um, if we, if we um, uh, think about what's happening here in this example of, of a controversy and compare it um, to, to the earlier uh, examples I, I, I gave here about the structures of visibility in, uh, in political discourse, I mean, one thing is, of course, um, that there are certain structures of visibility which are produced and reproduced all the time. Um, but the other thing is, and that's a very different thing, is there's a molecule that makes a difference. Does it work or not? And there are clinical tests uh, that can prove, um, I mean, within the scientific paradigm, of course, whether such a molecule works against uh, COVID-19. So we need to, to talk about two things. One thing is about who gets visibility, who is shown as a, a subject, and um, who, who speaks as a subject that can make a difference. That's one thing. And we see how populist politics works. I mean, this is really about uh, monopolizing visibility through all kinds of controversies. Uh, but the other thing is, and that's also important, and we shouldn't forget it, and that's, I think, where where, where I come now in with my, 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 my discussion of truth. The other thing is, um, are the claims all right? And the claims are not always all right. Um, and these claims, um, sometimes um, they can be established as true knowledge, um, as happened, for example, with the vaccine, um, which, uh, which did work, and uh, it, it worked very well, and it could be shown by, um, by people dying or not dying. Um, and it could be shown that uh, hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. And, uh, and that's, of course, a very different discourse where people interact uh, in hospitals uh, with patients, uh, with pharmaceutical companies uh, in order to, um, to test um, the molecule in a certain way. And that's uh, something that, um, that also plays a role. And of course, discourses that make claims about the world uh, they will depend on whether the world is like uh, they claim. And in this case, of course, it wasn't the case. And um, it's turned out it wasn't a big problem for the political actors because they don't depend on the veracity of a claim. Um, they depend on being ever more 
being ever more visible, and that worked very much. Um, but uh, there's another aspect where they're weak, and that's the question whether the claim is true and, and their position is credible. And, um, and that's where I want to come up with a more systematic the theoretical model of, um, of discourse and the question of um, how discourse works as a social practice um, and a practice also that turns around truth as, um, as a very important stake in discourse. So basically, if we want to generalize discourse, we can see that we live in a world, in a space uh, where there's a number of controversies, right? I mean, it's not only hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there are all kinds of controversies um, that um, that start and sometimes they end. Um, and in these controversies, there are more or fewer people who get involved, who get heated up, who get invested, who follow the debate. Um, and there are also some speakers, um, people who say something um, that makes a difference for for others, and others listen to these to these few speakers. So over time, there's a few subject positions bubbling up in these controversies. And as they bubble up, they monopolize the attention of all the others in the controversy. So normally there's a strong hierarchy between the few speakers who are listened to by everybody else um, and, and the many others who just listen without, um, uh, without speaking of themselves. So in a way, what happens over time is there's a concentration of um, visibility and of value. I mean, because visibility is... Uh, is very important for, for valuable subject positions uh, within very few people. And um, you can have um, a phenomenon like Trump uh, and the tr controversies, and you see billions of people following Trump in a way, or kind of following the debate, yeah? Not everybody is, is, uh, is okay with what he says, of course. Uh, the majority is probably against Trump and, and Bolsonaro, but they occupy the, the controversy, and, um, and everybody else... Um, by following, clicking, reacting, make these positions, these very few positions, extremely strong, powerful, and visible. And uh, what happens in a way is uh, there's a transfer of discursive labor from the many to the very few. The many, the, the, the very few uh, mono, monopolize the visibility, which is an effect of all the others participating, right? So it's not the genius or the talent, it's really an effect of many people coming together in these large communities. And, um, but this is not the end of the story. So, I mean, this is very easy to stop this concentration of visibility among very few people. But what happens in, uh, for example, in the democratic debate is um, there's the institutions and, and the institutions basically uh, make some of these positions official. In other words, the elections and some of the political actors involved in these um, controversies, they occupy official positions, for example, in parliament or in the government. Some become um, um, the um, head of state, heads of state like Trump. And um, there are certain procedures um, and a certain bureaucratic um, um, practice of uh, deciding who becomes the official representative of a community of discourse. And, um, and the point now is here, uh, the, this institutional side of, um, of, of this dynamic is very important because what institutions do is they, in, in a way, they suck in um, uh, subject positions which are constructed in large communities and they establish them uh, within a state system or within an institution. And uh, this is how democracy, democracy works. People are elected, um, not because um, they're especially um, intelligent or because they have a certain um, expertise. They're elected because they're seen as the representatives of large discourse communities. And that's uh, very natural, right? I mean, that's how democracy should work. And it, that's, I mean, I mean, normally it, it works like that. Um, and, and so um, within the institutions, within parliament, for example, you see then um, a whole number of uh, representatives of different discourse communities. And um, the problem, of course, is that, um, that these representatives, they're a product of um, discursive practices, discursive labor, discursive energy, 
which is mobilized by so many other um, people out, out there in discourse who are not um, represented um, in, in the institutions. So um, there's always uh, a transfer of um, discursive visibility um, within the communities, but also uh, through the institutional um, uh, procedure of electing certain people. Um, now, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying that um, this is a discourse, this is a social mechanism uh, which transfers um, a certain um, uh, certain uh, subject positions and the value they have. And this is not something that, that is subjective. I mean, the value within these subject positions that become official, which are elected, um, it is something that can't be ignored because it's a product of uh, huge communities. And um, so it's not just um, subjective um, um, who I vote for, um, it's it's the product of all these uh, dynamics of concentration and monopolization of discourse. Okay. Um, and now let me get back to um, um, to the question of truth, because if we understand that that public discourse always tends to um, to to privilege a very a very small elite of extremely visible actors, um, so I mean we're really talking about um, discourses where everybody's free. We all participate in these discourses in a very free way, but. Um, as a result of everybody talking about um, these problems, um, only very few are talked about. And, and these very few who are talked about, um, they um, occupy positions which do make a difference. And from these positions, um, they can impose their ideological agenda, right? So um, um, they don't represent the people they represent um, the most talked about position. And that's a big difference. And, um, and, and so the question that, that I think we should ask, I mean, given that um, discourse and, and, and political discourse in particular always tends to concentrate um, uh, within very few people, we need to ask, um, to what degree can we evaluate the quality of discourse um, that these very few discourse uh, actors um, can impose on everybody else. And, uh, and that's why we need um, to see the two phases of discourse. Uh, and uh, I, I see discourse, um, of course, as, um, um, as an activity where language is mobilized and used um, in order to, um, um, to make a difference in the social world, to communicate certain ideas, um, to, um, um, to do certain social things. Um, but I think it's important to see that um, the, the utterances that we use in discourse, that is the enunciados, um, um, they, they, they are quite ambivalent. They don't, do, they, they don't just convey information. Um, they do social things, but they're also used for epistemic things. And, um, and so if we analyze um, um, utterances, uh, one way of um, analyzing them is, and I think that's a very typical thing for the French tradition of discourse analysis, to ask to what degree um, utterances enoncé are used in order to, um, to, to, to show the subject position, right? I mean, from, from the linguistics of enunciation, uh, the question is, um, how does language uh, point to the subjects in discourse? How to uh, how do do how are people represented um, through through utterances and um, and how do people speak uh, through utterances? That's I think um, a very very uh, fundamental um, question in enunciative pragmatics, and um, and this is of course not only a linguistic problem, it's also a social problem because um, on the one hand um, there are certain subjects who speak. But as they speak and make themselves visible, they also speak about others and they make others visible. So um, um, it's, it's a quite complex activity of visibilizing all kinds of subjects in discourse as we use um, um, utterances in discourse. And it's not, not really controllable, right? We do this um, and uh, we intend to convey certain ideas, but um, we 
we make visible um, lots of things and invisibilize other things without thinking about it, right? So there are lots of things we can't control as we speak. And, um, and, and most of all, I think it's important to understand that as many people speak together and make uh, others visible and themselves visible or not, um, as a result of many speaking uh, together, there are some people who will emerge as um, the subjects who do make a difference, who everybody talks about, um, and uh, you will have many other subjects and, um, and participants of discourse um, who participate and, and create these subject positions, the very few everybody talks about, but these other subject positions, nobody will talk about. So there's a very fundamental hierarchy of um, visibility that, um, um, that of course, um, I, I showed in the previous analysis. But I think we shouldn't stop here because uh, the utterances that we use in discourse are also used in order to make claims. Utterances um, are, have a propositional content. Uh, utterances um, can uh, make claims about the world. I'm not saying that every utterance does that. But there are some utterances that do make factual uh, claims, like the example around hydroxychloroquine, right? This is a very clear claim. Uh, there are utterances claiming that hydroxychloroquine um, is, could be, would be a cure of COVID-19. So uh, <clears throat> there's an implicit standard uh, in that claim that uh, the truthfulness of the utterance can be evaluated depending on a certain state of the world. So in a way, uh, by, by pointing, referring to the world, the truthfulness of, um, of, of the utterance uh, will be defined um, according to certain um, developments out there in the world which are not discursive. And, um, and uh, the point now is that uh, this also is discursive, right? Um, there's a dynamics around claims. Claims circulate. And I showed you how the claim circulated from Chinese medical experts to Raoult, to Trump's Twitter account, uh, to Bolsonaro. So there's a claim um, that, um, um, that circulates in, in, in the international uh, media sphere. And as the claim circulates in the sphere, um, there are certain claim makers who are seen as responsible for the claim, um, like Raoult, Trump, Bolsonaro. And, um, and uh, the claim maker, as well as the claim, um, will be seen as truthful or not so truthful over time, right? So there are two um, things I think that uh, are very important here. One thing is, if the molecule turns out to work or not to work, that will mean that the claim will be seen to be true or untrue. And also the claim maker will be seen as credible or not credible, because of course, the more wrong claims we make, the less credible we will be um, seen by others. And, um, and so um, there's um, a discourse, a, a process of, um, of, of, um, of establishing, consolidating certain claims, certain knowledges, certain ideas as true or not so true. And, uh, and also there's a process of consolidating certain claim makers as um, credible or not so credible. And um, this is something that should be seen as, as, a, as a real um, hierarchy in discourse that also um, emerges. We have seen the social hierarchies, right, around um, um, these strong visible subject positions that emerge um, who monopolize detention and all the discursive um, mobilization of all the followers online, right? So that's one thing. Yeah, but the other thing is there are also certain claims, ideas, knowledges that circulate and they're seen with certain qualities over time. And um, as they circulate in discourse, um, as they stand the test of time, um, as they stand the test of reality as well, um, as there are certain uh, results from clinical trials, et cetera, they will uh, consolidate and be seen as um, and true and, and, and correct or not. And, and these are hierarchies that can be um, quite uh, important over time. And I mean, I can remind you of all the major scientific controversies um, who are also social controversies, like for example, is the earth round? Um, that was of course uh, something where 
um, scientists were killed for um, in the 16th century in Europe. Um, that is something that that mobilized so many people in a controversy that um, uh, that went on for for many years, for for hundreds of years. And nowadays, this is a claim which is extremely established. Um, it is seen as a truth uh, by um, not only the, the scientific community, uh, by uh, by every ed educated person in the world, basically. And this is something um, that um, that is a product of these processes where certain observations, which are not just uh, observations within discourse, but uh, the interaction with the outside world, with, with matter, uh, with things uh, that can be discursive or not discursive, um, turn out to be um, um, uh, true, turn out to fly in a way. And um, these are hierarchies in discourse, uh, which are very important um, to, to recognize. And these hierarchies of, of discourse, uh, as I said, not only concern a hierarchy of, of true and not so true and untrue knowledges. Um, and I mean, some claims like uh, the claim on um, uh, hydroxychloroquine has been debunked. Um, so um, it has been discarded. Uh, other claims uh, like the vaccine has been accepted. So um, there's um, a different quality of the claim that uh, that can be recognized. But those who, who, who made the claims, um, uh, they, of course, are rewarded with credibility if the claim turns out right or they're seen as uncredible, uh, that is, they lose in, in reputation and in uh, credibility if their claims uh, don't work. And of course, um, this is a hierarchy that should be uh, seen um, in terms of um, something we can't ignore. We can't ignore the social hierarchies between very visible subject positions and those who, um, who just participate without being visible. That's something, I mean, uh, no participant of that discourse can ignore. But we should also uh, recognize that there are hierarchies of the quality of um, truth of certain claims and the claim makers. So there's certain claim makers who have shown through the history of making claims that they're right. Um, and, uh, and of course, I mean, we have lots of um, specialists um, who take a lot of time in order to make claims that can stand the test of reality. And, uh, and some of them can do it very well. And, and people sometimes know who these people are who can do it very well. And so there's um, an epistemic hierarchy in discourse, right, uh, based on the credibility of the claim maker. And um, at the same time, people know that certain claims um, have been established as truth and uh, everybody um, can build on them and there's no discussion anymore. Um, I'm not saying that there's some universal truth out there um, that, um, that, that I can um, have access to in any way. But I, I do want to uh, acknowledge that out there in these discourses, um, there's different uh, degrees of um, truthfulness um, and there's a hierarchy of uh, true and not so true discourses, just as there's a hierarchy of um, visible and not so visible actors. Now, I want to start to come to a conclusion uh, for my talk because I'm not at the end yet, but um, almost. Now, um, I guess what I said is not extremely controversial. Um, upon thinking, I mean, we can recognize it's not just about social hierarchies, there's also epistemic hierarchies, and both should be seen in terms of something that matters, right? I mean, matters in the very ambivalent sense that we recognize it as, as something that, that we can't ignore. Uh, it matters because we have, um, we value it as well, right? So um, social and, um, and epistemic hierarchies are both something that are very, very crucial that define um, hierarchies within discourse. And, um, and we work and recognize these, uh, these hierarchies normally. And um, the question now, of course, is, I mean, if we have a look at populist post-truth discourses, which is a very special type of discourse, of course, and um, it's very easy to, to show um, that uh, people like uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, and other uh, populist uh, post-truth po politicians, uh, they're not, not very high on the epistemic hierarchy, right? They're very high on the social hierarchy because they're very, very visible. But I think most people, uh, even their followers, will, will not really bank on, on, on selling their souls on, on their predictions um, concerning a cure, right? I mean... Uh, I'm pretty sure that um, most people will recognize that um, 
that these claims um, were not always uh, right and they may not be right in the future either. And, um, and now uh, the question of course is, how does it work in our academic discourse? In our academic discourse, uh, of course, I mean, we are experts, we are specialists of certain areas. And um, we are trained in order to come up with claims that turn out to be true, right? And that's uh, why we're paid and why we are recognized as important in society. Now, um, of course, as scientists, uh, we are outraged um, at what happens in the populist realm with um, Bolsonaro and, um, and Trump, who make these unfounded claims um, that are sometimes out outright lies, but which are successful because they mobilize um, uh, uh, the subjects that follow us and they, they give visibility. Now, if we have a look at what happens in the academic discourse, it's not that different. I'm not saying that um, academic and populist discourse is the same at all. I mean, they're definitely very, very different traditions. They're very different criteria. They're very, very different practices um, between both. Even within academic discourse, there's so many different um, uh, ways of constructing knowledge and of, of participating in these discourses around truth. Um, it's very, I mean, it's a very heterogeneous uh, area, but um, it's very, very different from populist um, discourse um, a la Trump and, and Bolsonaro. Uh, however, we need to recognize uh, there are social hierarchies um, that are constructed, that emerge in academic discourses. And um, these social hi hierarchies, uh, they come from um, many people using utterances in order to position, position themselves and others as subjects, uh, to, to speak as subjects and to speak about subjects. And what we see here in my work on um, academics, I've measured um, the citation visibility in in certain fields. I've done that for discourse studies in, in Europe, in um, UK, France, and Germany. And um, I found um, the 99 professors in, in 2015, um, I, and that's all the professors that, that, that exist, right, in, at that time. Uh, the 99 professors of discourse studies or discourse analysis, discourse linguistics um, in, in these three countries. And I, uh, I tried to measure um, their visibility within academic discourse. Um, I used Google Scholar as, as a very rough indicator for, for citation visibility. Um, I don't think there's a better one. Um, I mean, you can definitely say there's a bias within the indicator. So, I mean, there's lots of uh, things that you can do in order to question uh, that it's precise. But what you can definitely see is, without any doubt, there's a great deal of concentration uh, of visibility uh, within our disciplines. Um, I just have the professors here, which is the, um, I'm not sure about the Brazilian uh, terminology. In Spanish, it's catedraticos, that is the established senior professors um, in universities, which is a small um, elite. It's the most established academics, uh, the most research-oriented academics in, um, in these institutions. And, um, and what I find is that 10% of all these active professors um, in 2015 are cited more than all the other professors together. So um, academic discourse from a social point of view is anything but equal. And, um, and I could go on and show um, how citation vis visibility is, um, um, is, is distributed among actors here. There's lots of things I, I could say, I won't. Uh, what I can say is um, the strong concentration of visibility in academia is something um, that I can see in all fields. Uh, I'm not even um, uh, talking here about non-European discourses. And if you factor in the kind of global hierarchies of, of academic discourse, um, the result is probably even more extreme. Um, and and so there's um, no way that you can see academia, uh, academia as, a, as a socially neutral space. There is a great deal of um, hierarchy of recognition, which is unequal uh, between actors. And this is um, not all about talent and, um, and achievement uh, only, right? I mean, um, I, I'm not saying that, uh, that it's uh, totally uh, arbitrary. I'm, I'm not saying either that 
that the quantity reflects quality in any way, because of course, some of these professors, they work in very small fields, and then the numbers are very small. I mean, that's that's clear. But uh, there's a tendency in, in any kind of field to concentrate um, uh, visibility in, in one or two academics. And that's something um, that I think we should reflect on. In the case of academia, I think uh, it's, it's a promise. Um, it's a promise of, um, of eternal recognition that is given to participants of a game. Um, it's a promise that, um, that incentivizes many people in academic discourse to, um, to, to, to dedicate their lives to research. And some do it. I mean, um, it depends a bit, perhaps. And, um, and so um, it is not necessarily something bad. It can be the reason why academics um, do so many things without being paid, right? So it's, it's precisely perhaps the reason why academics um, enter um, academia. They want to, um, to get recognition at some point later on in life, which is not material, um, it's discursive. Um, and um, it is very meaningful to them and very important. And, um, and it's something that, um, that keeps the whole system um, going. And, uh, and so um, it's, uh, it's probably a very ambivalent phenomenon, this very strong uh, um, concentration of uh, visibility in academia, uh, but it's not all bad. Um, at the same time, uh, of course, uh, there's a strong sens sensitivity um, uh, concerning the, the importance of, um, of um, ideas, of projects, of claims that, um, um, that can be defended as true, as legitimate in, in these discourses. Now, um, um, I mean, it's definitely very difficult for any academic to talk about truth, and especially for these academics here, right, uh, who are very much accustomed to constructivist ideas about um, uh, truth being um, an effect of, of uh, social practices. Um, but um, I, I guess that in, in, in our areas, um, most people would, uh, would agree, I guess, that if there were factually untrue claims, uh, that could be the end of, of a research career. Uh, people can't afford to cheat or to plagiarize um, if, um, if they're um, um, unveiled um, and, um, and, and, um, and uh, discovered as, um, as a cheat, um, that there will be consequences. And, um, and, and of course, I mean, uh, their reputation depends not only on factual claims and on many other things, uh, but I think um, it's very important to come up with ideas that are coherent, which, um, which can be recognized as, as workable, uh, viable uh, for, for many other people. And it's important um, to participate in this collective construction of, of a viable epistemological, epistemic basis. Um, so in order to bring the um, scientific debate forward. Now, this is perhaps a bit long wounded and uh, a bit complicated um, to talk about uh, truth in, in academia, but um, uh, I think it's very important um, that we get a sense or keep the sense of some things that are said, some problems, some ideas in academia that have proven the test of time, right? They, they have resisted all kinds of um, very difficult uh, arguments, uh, very controversial um, debates. Um, they have shown to be um, workable for large uh, groups of specialized experts. And uh, that means there's a certain quality of, uh, of knowledge that, um, that, uh, that has been made possible within the academic area. And, um, and the quality of that knowledge that uh, emerges as a, as a product of so many people working together, whether they're visible or not, right? I mean, both are equally important in order for the system to work. Um, the quality of that knowledge needs to be recognized as important for us. And I think we all feel what is um, um, valuable um, academic knowledge and what is bullshit. And we are all trained in, in distinguishing uh, between, uh, between uh, the different types of quality. And this is something we should be um, seriously um, proud of. And, um, and now um, that's where I want to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to conclude finally. Um, I've talked here about um, social and 
epistemic hierarchies that uh, emerge as a result of many people uh, cooperating, discussing, using language in large communities. And um, I try to explain um, and, and give you a model of how discourse works, um, namely as, as a practice of, um, of using uh, utterances uh, in order to um, create um, social subject positions and, um, and also using utterances in order to make certain claims. And um, if we consider that these uh, utterances are used in large discourses where millions of people can take part, sometimes um, over generations, I mean, I, um, I mentioned um, the example of the Earth, uh, the Earth is round. That's, of course, um, an achievement um, of uh, many generations, not only of scientists, but so many people participating in such a discourse that um, we need to recognize, of course, uh, that in th these controversies, there are always some people um, who occupy um, the very visible um, elite. Um, there are millions of others um, who participate, who create this very visible elite without being cited themselves. Um, that's something that, uh, that happens. Um, that can be good or bad in terms of um, the structures of visibility that are showed between the newspapers um, in, in the English um, uh, media sphere. And, uh, and the way that certain American politicians are made visible, it is a strong incentive to, um, to produce bad knowledge, obviously, right? And that, in that structure of visibility, it is very, very, very difficult um, to, um, to gain visibility and to um, gain power uh, with true knowledge. But um, I've, I've given you the example of academic discourses where you also see extreme hierarchies between visible and invisible academics. And it might be an incentive for people to uh, give all their best in order to uh, come up with even better knowledge. So um, it is a very kind of um, ambivalent um, um, phenomenon, which we need to investigate in order to understand why it can be um, positive or negative. Uh, but at any time, at any rate, what I want to, um, to conclude with is, uh, we as academics, um, we know that there's um, certain knowledges which can be defended, right? And which can be more true than others. And this is something uh, that we should be uh, very, very uh, proud of. And, um, and there are certain social positions um, whose, um, whose power is based on, 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 on pure quantity, on, um, on the mobilization of uh, media and, and of, of economic power. And um, they definitely make a difference. Um, that doesn't mean that they have um, a monopoly over the epistemic hierarchies. And uh, we, can, we can use the epistemic value of discourse, um, of the discourse that are truer than other discourse, in order to criticize um, the social hierarchies. And that's how I think uh, we should engage as citizens, as scientists, um, into a productive um, uh, political debate um, as citizens um, in these contemporary discourses and not leave um, the debate um, to the Trumps um, and, uh, and Bolsonaro's um, who occupy the, the, the scene with uh, the claims around hydroxychloroquine. So that is my um, model of discourse as a positioning and claim-making practice where it's not only about social hierarchies of visibility, uh, but also about um, hierarchies of epistemic value. Thank you very much. Obrigada, professor Johannes. Uh, você me escuta? Sim. Sim. Muito obrigada pela sua exposição, muito instigante e atual, né? de fato provocativa. E estamos, então, portanto, abertos para perguntas. As pessoas podem se manifestar oralmente ou com... É, inscrições no chat. Eu gostaria de é, começar fazendo um, um primeiro comentário. Né? Sim? Sobre é, esse processo discursivo que hoje, de fato, é muito bem estabelecido, como você mostrou, né? muito bem estabelecido com a 
apoio da tecnologia digital, mas que é antigo, né? É antigo, mas hoje muito bem estabelecido e isso nos convoca a todos, como pesquisadores e como cidadãos, a nos implicarmos, né? E, e talvez, é, inclusive não separando exatamente essas duas faces na perspectiva da pesquisa. Algo que me chamou a atenção na sua exposição é exatamente o, o lugar já conhecido numa perspectiva é, do capitalismo, das relações de poder e as hierarquias produzidas como efeito né, dessas relações de poder. Né? O poder se institui por meio delas e, e assegura. E aí, e essas, eh, eh, esses dois aspectos são centrais para a gente compreender valor e visibilidade. Né? E visibilidade. E aí eu fiquei pensando, eh, tanto no que respeita ao discurso populista, mas também, e talvez sobretudo, porque isso me interessa como pesquisadora, no discurso científico, no discurso acadêmico, a gente passa a viver a visibilidade não exatamente como consequência do dizer, como consequência do, do dizer em vários campos né, é, da esfera humana e especificamente no campo científico, mas passa a viver a visibilidade como meta, como objetivo do dizer científico. E isso me parece ser, de fato, muito preocupante em termos dos efeitos na construção de conhecimento, na circulação e na construção de conhecimentos. Né? Isso me lembra a sua uh, expressão no outro texto né, com, uh, com uma colega, é, que é o capitalismo discursivo no universo é, acadêmico. Né? Então, é, eu penso que isso traz é, para a linguística, para os analistas dos discursos, de discurso, uma agenda é, de, de trabalho, né? uma agenda de trabalho, de fato, muito importante, se você quiser comentar. Esse é um, um primeiro é, aspecto. E a segunda eu fiquei pensando eh, em que medida esta, eh, a focalização do valor epistêmico do discurso na sua abordagem teria alguma aproximação com a, a, a abordagem da dimensão eh, da moral como faz lá a, a Marianne Pavot. Mas se isso, se isso lhe interessar. É, só que me ocorreu, eu, eu pensei uh, se seria possível estabelecer né, uh, uh, uma inter-relação entre uh, a relação entre moral e linguagem que é, é preconizada pela Marianne Pavot, é, numa ideia de ética das virtudes discursivas, e é, esta é, consideração do valor epistêmico do discurso como algo para o que a gente deve olhar. Não sei se fui clara, muito obrigada pela sua é, exposição. Yeah, um, thank you. I will I respond in English, I'm afraid. And um, I, um, I, I, I agree. I mean, we can also ask the question about discursive of capitalism uh, within our um, academic um, realm, right? That's, I think, your first question. And there's, a, of course, um, I mean, a kind of race for, for the most visible prestigious um, positions and um, kind of sometimes a bit cheap debates around something that give um, some doubtful visibilities to some 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 colleagues. And um, yeah, of course, I mean, this can be um, questioned uh, from all kinds of sides and it's a very kind of um, ambivalent thing. Um, I mean, 
um, if, if we talk about who makes a difference in criticizing Trump in linguistics, there's per perhaps one person uh, who, who, who is heard outside linguistics, and that is Noam Chomsky. Now, now Noam Chomsky is somebody who is probably um, more like an, an adversarial figure for discourse studies and pragmatics and, and all these soci socially minded people like us. Um, but he's cited uh, within linguistics so much more than all the discursive people. Um, he, he is the discursive capitalist of linguistics. Um, and, um, and this is something um, that, that can be very doubtful because, I mean, his approach, I think, is very much open to all kinds of criticism. I, um, um, I don't think I, I would agree with what, what he does in, in linguistics a lot. I, I, I mean, I find it quite difficult to follow, to be honest, but um, I, I think many of these things are very, very doubtful because he just doesn't uh, recognize the social dimension at all. Now, that's that's a scientific academic debate, um, and I recognize that he is um, a legend in terms of citation visibility, and he's he can't be ignored. Whatever you think about him, he can't be ignored, and he can't be ignored even by people outside linguistics. And he's the only linguist who can something uh, who, who can say something against Trump, and be heard. So um, being visible is not always bad. I mean, if you want to make a difference, and, and I think um, if, if you have good ideas, <laughs> you have all the interest in order to, 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 to make a difference, then you should make sure that you're heard. And then visibility is important. So, um, um, I think it would be um, difficult to moralize uh, visibility as something good or bad. Um, and, and we should understand how it works and what it is used for. And it's, I mean, how our social world works. Um, I must admit, I didn't quite understand the second question. Maybe you can um, uh, repeat it. Uh, you said something about uh, the epistemic quality of, of discourse and how it relates to moral and ethical questions a la Marine, Marianne Bavou. And I, I, I'm i not aware, I mean, what you're referring to. Sim. 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 Se de fato, uh, se seria possível estabelecer uma interrelação uh, entre uh, a dimensão epistêmica do discurso, colocada em destaque na sua abordagem, é, ela, ela é colocada é, em, em destaque na sua abordagem, e é, exatamente a, a defesa da Marianne Pavot relativamente à relação entre é, moral e discurso, quando ela vai se perguntar algo como é possível mesmo dizer tudo e qualquer coisa? Né? Nesta pergunta, né, é, é claro que é, a noção de moral ela tem um, um espectro muito amplo em termos de perspectiva, né? mas a minha pergunta é a apropriação uh, de uma dada dimensão de moral uh, para exatamente eh, a, a gente estabelecer eh, eh, determinados, determinadas orientações para compreender o valor epistêmico do discurso. Uh, não hum. sei se consegui ser clara, eh, mas talvez seja uh, algo que apenas uh, 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 veio à minha cabeça por conta de leituras recentes e... e Talvez seja algo precipitado de minha parte, mas eu percebi é, é, possibilidades de articulação e, bom, e, e agradeço é, a você por é, me possibilitar esse insight, que não sei se é um bom insight, <risos> não sei, pode não ser bom, é, 
mas é algo que eu gostaria de, de depois pensar um pouco sobre isso. Mas, é, é, gostei, yeah, gostei muito de ver essa dupla face. Né? Yeah. Essa... Um, I think what you're referring to, and I'm not uh, sufficiently aware of um, Marianne's uh, work on uh, La Morale um, and, and the discourse. Um, uh, what I think you refer to is, I mean, what, what I talked uh, about uh, when I talk about truth and the epistemic value of discourse, I, I talk about a very, very, very small aspect of discourse, which is factual claims. Factual claims is something which we normally don't make. Uh, especially not um, academics, because uh, factual claims are very dangerous. They can turn out to be wrong, and then we are discredited, and then it's end of the career. <laughs> well, um, no, not, but I mean, uh, we talk about so many other things which are not factual. Um, and in many ways, uh, what we talk about is um, more about moral aspects of discourse. That is, um, uh, a broader idea of truth, uh, which refers to um, a kind of social moral truth, something which is um, respectable, um, which is up to our civilizational norms, for example, um, which can be considered um, in, in different contexts. Um, so um, that type of truth, which, um, which is much less um, concrete, uh, I think um, uh, we should also um, think about, and um, what I would think of is uh, here is uh, Hannah Arendt, the political theorist, um, who had um, a great interest in um, the question of political truth um, uh, in the face of totalitarianism. And, um, and I think this is um, a strand of, of work which, um, which is a bit forgotten because um, after the Second World War, um, at least in Europe, we no longer thought about totalitarianism and war and these, these bad things. Um, but I think they have become very topical again. And um, we need to, um, to uh, have a broader uh, notion of quality of discourse as something that also pertains to, to the question of um, moral accept acceptability, something that humanity can accept or something like that. Uh, now, this is something um, I think which is um, which is more abstract and less um, concrete because you can't falsify it easily. If the molecule doesn't work in the case of hydroxychloroquine, the claim is dead. If um, if if you think about um, uh, the way that uh, Bolsonaro had um, kind of instigated uh, the, um, the rising in Brasilia or Trump uh, uh, on the capital, um, then I think, I mean, we understand this is wrong uh, because it's anti-democratic. But of course, I mean, the, the proof uh, to show that it's anti-democratic and wrong in that sense is, um, is, is a lot more difficult and it's a, a lot more subjective and interpretive. But I think the problem is the same. There are certain hierarchies of um, moral um, quality, which I think um, are not subjective. Um, we, um, we have constructed them in generations of um, participating in these discourses and they are matter. They, 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 they are matter that matter to us. And, um, and that's why um, I think um, way too often we have thought in terms, uh, we, thought, we have thought of truth and these moral questions in terms of what I find good or bad. But it's not about subjectivity, it's about um, discursive achievements that, um, that need to be recognized, that can't be ignored. And I think that's something we should um, try to get a vocabulary for in order to, to account for. Because if we say it's all the same, like the radical constructivists, that is not, that's not really, I mean, that, that can't be the answer in, in, um, in, uh, for these discourses. Obrigada, professor. Muito obrigada. Uh, quem quiser uh, fazer pergunta pode abrir o microfone e o Gabriel uh, nos ajuda aqui.
you will need to speak slowly, just as nicely and slowly as uh, Juliana. Jani? Sim. Só um minutinho, Juliana. Estou aqui. Bom, eu ia levantar minha mãozinha, mas é, eu vou falar devagar. É, primeiramente, eu quero agradecer ao professor por essa bela discussão, essa bela reflexão. E gostaria muito de ouvir um comentário do senhor a partir da problemática que o senhor traz aqui da visibilidade da situação acadêmica, é um comentário é, do seu estudo apresentado no livro Análise do Discurso Pós-Estruturalista, em que é um belo capítulo que o senhor analisa excertos de textos reconhecidos pela comunidade acadêmica. E nesse trabalho... É, é, em alguma medida, o senhor também problematiza né, a, a possibilidade de haver grandes textos publicados em blogs, em, em panfletos, em jornais, que trazem também reflexões super importantes, mas elas não alcançam o status dos grandes das grandes citações ou dos grandes autores consagrados. Muito obrigada, viu, professor? Um, I, I didn't quite... The, the sound quality was slightly less um, crisp. Uh, I didn't quite get the question. Is a question? A rigor não é uma pergunta o é um desejo de ouvir um comentário né, do senhor, do seu próprio livro, né, de um dos capítulos que vai falar sobre a, um trabalho que se desenvolve, que recorre ao excertos de grandes textos consagrados para pensar como que essas citações circulam. Uhum. Yeah, so your question is about uh, how these... Um these great um, citations um, of the structuralist controversy were, were created? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think um, um, there's the Portuguese um, uh, version of my post-structuralist discourse analysis book, which uh, shows how in these very theoretical texts of um, yes. structuralist and post-structuralist um, um, uh, of, of this structuralist post-structuralist controversy, how certain subject positions um, are constructed and how the uh, the idea of, of a collective movement um, is, is kind of evoked and constructed across different texts. And um, so, I mean, I was very much interested in how these, um, these references um, kind of emerge from these debates and um and um and uh, i mean what what i did in, in in the book that you refer to is um to um to look for the uh, markers of enunciation and um the um um the kind of ways of um of enacting and uh, encoding subjectivity in these texts which um which come across as non-subjective because they're kind of scientific, right? And um and so um um I mean the idea of, of, of the whole book was that even though I mean these books, um these uh, debates were very much conceptual, very much theoretical, very abstract, uh very anti-subjective, they're deeply subjective because they always refer to somebody speaking. And uh, what you see in a way is uh, a great concentration of visibility among very, very, very few um, speakers of that debate of the time. And, um, and that's, um, that's, that's an interesting effect because it happens in a very, um, very kind of um, cosmopolitan, uh, very kind of egalitarian community with strong um, uh, moral values for equality and, and, um, and democracy, I mean, mostly. 
And, um, and so what happens in academic discourse here, I mean, and this is something that happens in many other fields as well, uh, is that, um, that at the end of the day, there are three people who everybody cites and, um, and everybody else talks about these three people, but nobody talks about the people who talk about them. And, um, and that's, of course, something that, that happens very naturally whenever there's um, discourse among many people. But um, I, I briefly mentioned the role of institutions. And um, the institutions are important because they, um, they reproduce that system and they create status hierarchies between people. And they, um, um, they um, make these, um, these hierarchies permanent in, in kind of um, institutional kind of um, um, uh, distinctions. And um, there's the other book, I think, that hasn't been translated into Portuguese around the social aspects um, of, of that generation and how uh, these actors of this structuralist controversy, they were placed in, in the French educational institutions. And, um, and um, I try to show that they, um, they drew, drew on very specific um, institutional backgrounds, resources, um, uh, different families, social networks. Um, that's the book around uh, why there's no post-structuralism in France. And, um, and I try to, um, to explain it's not only um, a discursive phenomenon, but it's also um, a social group um, who can draw on certain um, backgrounds. And, um, and so I think it's always important um, um, to, to think about uh, how these discursive hierarchies and, and inequalities like visibility and the non-discursive, um, the institutional and the economic and the political hierarchies, how they play together, because um, it's it's always um, the, the the two together. And and thank you for this question. I I I, I never thought of um, of visibility in, in terms of that generation, but um, I think um, it's it's interesting. It's important to have a discussion around visibility, especially among the most humanities oriented and most theoretical de debates that we have in our discourse. Because um, I guess normally the most philosophical um, debates are the most focused on very few references, sometimes very old references. And um, I find it interesting. I don't know why it is, but um, um, uh, it's, I mean, you have uh, linguistics discourses where you cite active, other academics in these very academic uh, philosophical and, and, and humanities like discourses, you, you cite dead academics. And that's interesting. Um, um, and it's, it's part of, of a certain culture and tradition probably, but it's, it's, it's a very social thing. It's, it's not um, because it's good or, or bad. It's just, I mean, um, to, to create social relationships which are very different from um, uh, from from other social relationships. Eu agradeço muito o seu comentário e quero se eu trouxe a cena essa pauta do livro que talvez possa ser uma reflexão tangencial em relação ao grande objeto da palestra, mas o fiz porque é, é um livro que traz uma análise muito fina sobre esse processo né, de mostração dos grandes pensadores. Muito obrigada. Yeah. Muito yeah, obrigada. Thank you. thank you for that. That's very nice. And um, uh, indeed, I, I didn't quite think of that. But yeah, it's 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 you can do the same thing with, with, um, with the structuralists. <laughs> obrigada, Jane. Acho que a professora Evangela quer fazer uma pergunta. Ainda temos tempo, um pouquinho. Fale, Bom dia, eu estou aqui encantada por ouvi-lo, sou sua leitora também, então, já o citei <risos> várias vezes, acho que é uma forma, né, como você está dizendo, a gente cita os grandes aí, alguns até já falecidos, como uma forma de validação do outro e também de autovalidação, que é uma cobrança, né, é, todo o tempo, que nós sofremos, as injunções na academia. E eu fiz uma reflexão aqui, ouvindo, é, é preciso conhecer para efetuar rupturas. 
nós sabemos que a hierarquização é inerente Sim. à vida. Não, não, Fala mais devagar. Fala mais devagar. Ah, devagar. Sorry. É, é. Nós sabemos que a hierarquização é inerente à vida, social, acadêmica, etc. É inerente às áreas epistemológicas, hard sciences versus soft sciences, é inerente às áreas geográficas, às epistemologias do norte, às epistemologias do sul, como o gráfico ali deixou né, extremamente visível. É, é inerente às universidades, os ranqueamentos nacionais e internacionais fazem isso, né? É, e aí, como formadora de professores, eu fiquei pensando aqui de que modo nós podemos é, nos, nos fortalecer em termos de, de criação de estratégias para enfrentar esses afunilamentos excessivos. Nós lidamos com eles, nem sempre da melhor forma possível, às vezes com frustração, às vezes tentando produzir mais rápido em detrimento da qualidade para poder atender a essas injunções, a essas métricas né, que nos governam. Então, é, o que, que a gente poderia, assim, como que você visualiza alguma forma como formadores de professores que a gente possa, né? É, é, porque a educação é a melhor, é o melhor caminho. Então esses nossos alunos serão multiplicadores, né? Na educação básica e no ensino superior também. Então é isso que eu gostaria, se possível, de ouvir. E agradeço muitíssimo. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, if if I knew, I don't know. <laughs> I would be very very um, happy if I had had a response here. Um, I'm not sure. Um... Mas eu acho que enquanto eu estava falando aí com a Jane, a gente vê conhecendo mais, percebendo essa, essas essas formas, né, de de visibilização. Eu não tinha a menor ideia disso que o gráfico mostrou, né? como que é, a gente intui algumas coisas. Ah, e o Trump, gente, como que o Trump tem tanto poder? Então, assim, eu acho que são as, essas pesquisas, as nossas pesquisas, as, as, essas pesquisas todas que vão é, desvelando essas formas de, de poder, né? porque enquanto elas estão encobertas, nós todos estamos sendo manipulados por elas, sem, hum. sem, sem saber como reagir. E, inclusive, esses insights, né, como, por exemplo, da Juliana, sobre a questão da moral. Nós somos premidos por, por leis morais, nós acadêmicos, muito fortes. Nós não podemos é, é, propagar mentiras, porque isso tem um impacto muito grande. Então, eu acho que a disseminação dessas, né, dessas informações, a formação dos nossos alunos, é uma forma de enfrentamento. Estudar por que, que esses que são mais citados o são, né? por que, que nós continuamos falando de Stuart Hall, de, né? por que, que nós continuamos falando de Jones, que, que está aí na atualidade, como você falou, né? desmistificar certas lendas também, acredito, é uma forma de é, atuar nesse sentido. Porque todos somos falíveis, né? Okay. Yeah, Muito obrigada. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think I couldn't agree more. And um, um, I mean, how we uh, we make a difference um, in the world um, through our students, um, through the work we do um, from the very um, specific place um, in, in, in our world, in our global world, um, that, that is, of course, uh, very difficult. And But I think maybe... Um, Uh, you you said it um, that I mean we live in 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 an academic space where, which which allows for so many different um, practices and solutions and epistemologies and and ways of thinking and ways of doing and and and, and experimenting that um, that we can um, that we can make a difference by 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 producing something new. Um, by um, 
by producing some some new solution um, to 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 these problems, and um, and um, and and I think it's um, it's 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 important to be aware that of course we we uh, we react to a certain problem which is not never just academic. I mean, um, it would be really um, strange if if we invented our own problems, right? I mean, we work on problems that come from the real world. Eu, eu achei muito interessante quando você, ao final, falou que nós, como cientistas da linguagem, do discurso, nós precisamos atuar também na mesma dimensão como cidadãos. Acho que é um caminho. Sair né, a universidade fora da Torre de Marfim, é, aquela metáfora né, do distanciamento. Então, é uma ciência engajada. Né? Yeah, yeah. Muito... I mean... I think in 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 these post-truth politics moments, uh, we 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 became aware that I mean, we are never just academics, right? We are always citizens, and um, and and in these moments, the the, the line is very diff difficult to draw, and and we need to accept that and uh, and work with it and not reject it. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Eu que agradeço. Obrigada, Evangela. Olha, nós temos uma última pergunta, uh, para não excedermos o tempo, que é do Tiago Ruas de Egues, é, doutorando do programa. Ele é, escreveu a pergunta no chat, como uma pergunta sobre visibilidade, e ele pergunta, é, como reverter ou diminuir a invisibilidade de sujeitos que não pertencem à elite acadêmica? Obrigada, Tiago. Oh, I think it's the precisely the this question is uh, the reason why there's sociology. Everybody wonders why, 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 and um, there's a ton of research. And um, um, I mean, I have a response, but I'm, I'm not sure it's really the solution. But um, I think what, what sometimes happens is there's a stabilization of um, hierarchies in, in academia through um, certain mechanisms which, um, um, which in a way, create a kind of unilateral um, um, way of evaluating um, people and, and, and work. And, and there's a way of, there's an idea, for example, that there's one kind of um, standard of evaluation that can be applied to everything, everybody and all work. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that in order to break the system um, and these strong hierarchies within academia and also elsewhere, of course, we need to um, to allow that there's a heterogeneity of standards and uh, there's a productive um, struggle between different ways of uh, doing and and evaluating uh, research. And um, and that 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 is important in order to um, to allow. Um, voices and, and and work which in in the current system doesn't have its niche and um and and how exactly how to do it it's it's not that easy i think i'm i'm quite critical of um of any kind of vision that um breaks down um uh, the quality to one single criterion um i'm very critical of um breaking down quality to um to one number Uh, or to numbers in general. Um, I'm quite critical of, um, of these kind of homogenizing attempts to uh, represent academia as, um, as a kind of neat space. I think we need um, to, um, to recognize that there are lots, lots of different, very important ways of doing academia. And maybe a second response to this very important question is that um, I think we need to, um, to find a way to acknowledge the very valuable work that is done by people who are not visible. And uh, there's a problem with the current politics of academic excellence uh, that 
that rewards those who already have visibility. And in a way, they, they double um, the reward by giving money to those who ha have already gotten the pr prestige and the reputation from everybody else. And, um, and that, that, that approach doesn't really reflect on, um, on the origin of the value that is produced in academia. And, um, and the value that, that is produced uh, comes from everybody, all those who are not heard and who don't speak in academia as well, who participate by, um, by participating in events, by participating in, um, in, in publications, who write, who read, who react, um, who, who, who interact with people but um, who are not um, sufficiently heard because the dynamics uh, that, that we know um, um, exclude them from, from making a difference. But, um, but, but of course, I mean, I, I always get, get angry when I, uh, when I hear that rhetorics of excellence um, that doesn't reflect on, on the perverse effects of, um, of, of putting a lot of money, a lot of resources into the hands of, of the very few who already got it right, and um, and we need a mechanism to redistribute that um, that wealth in a way, because uh, there's no academic system that can work without those who do the work without being heard. So um, we need a redistribution of um, of resources to those who are not heard, and how we can do it. Um, uh, without um, going against ideas of quality and of uh, performance is very difficult because of course, I mean, our whole system um, is, is, um, is set up as a meritocratic system where everybody believes in, um, in, in, in getting attention and, and, um, and, and succeeding by, 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 by getting more feedback and better, better um, uh, evaluations. And um, and so visibility is um, is the very basic currency of of our of um, of our sector, and um, and if we um, give re resources um, that is not based on that currency, um, the question is how do we make sure that it goes to where the quality is, and that's so that's why it's so so difficult and such a um, such an important question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm quite um, under the weather today. I'm really sorry. I wasn't very well today. Uh, I was a bit slow, and um, I um, I sometimes had a bit problem um, problems um, um, speaking. But um, yeah. Não, estava muito obrigada, Professor Johannes. Uh, nós temos aqui mais uma pergunta, mas infelizmente não temos tempo. Uh, uh, o nosso tradutor Gabriel Fernandino a quem agradeço imensamente pelo trabalho, ele tem uh, outra agenda agora. É uma pergunta da, da Fernanda, interessada em relacionar o papel da liberdade de expressão com o processo de visibilidade da extrema-direita, mas fica isso uh, para um outro momento, porque nós temos sim a intenção, professor Johannes, de tê-lo aqui em Belo Horizonte brevemente, né? para uma missão de trabalho, esse é o nosso desejo, e vamos, portanto, entrar em contato para que isso possa acontecer. Eu agradeço muitíssimo a sua participação, fechando o nosso seminário, agradeço mais uma vez a participação do Gabriel Fernandino, dos professores, dos alunos e das pessoas que estão também nos acompanhando pelo YouTube, hoje e em outros momentos. Se o senhor quiser é, se despedir. É muito prazer e muito obrigado pelo um, uh, convite. Um, um, eu gosto muito, muito de falar com, com os companheiros brasileiros. Uh, é um muito, muito, uh, muito grande prazer. Muito obrigado. Obrigada, professor. E obrigada pelo português. <risos> muito obrigada. Então, um, boa tarde <risos> para você e boa tarde para nós também, que já é meio-dia. <risos> Vocês também. <risos> um grande abraço. E yeah, até logo.
Até logo, até breve, até brevíssimo. <risos>